The following is an exclusive presentation of Optimum Local. It's Optimum or it's not. The information provided during the following program is not intended as a substitute for medical advice. Personal health concerns should be brought to the attention of your health care provider. Health Talk is brought to you by Cablevision in association with the Sound Shore Medical Center. Your hosts are Pat Pingatori, a registered nurse and director of the hospital's community relations. And Sal Shalero, director of media relations. Stay up to date on the latest medical topics coming up on Health Talk. Welcome to Health Talk. I'm Pat Pingatori. And I'm Sal Shalero. Plastic and reconstructive surgery is an area of medicine that has significantly advanced in the past few years. Here today from Sound Shore Medical Center to discuss these recent advances is plastic and reconstructive surgeon Dr. Rafael Magaña and Dr. Dominic Golio, a clinical assistant professor of surgery. Welcome. Gentlemen, Thank welcome you. to Thank the you. show. Welcome. Talk to us about plastic surgery. First of all, what's the typical patient like? Who, who comes to see you? It varies. Some patients are, are very young. Mm -hmm. uh, and some patients young? are yes, very young or very old. It depends. It's a what broad could spectrum. What's wrong with a young patient? Well, yeah. for the young patients, especially with the cleft lip and cleft palate, we uh, do the reconstructive surgery on the babies okay. who have the congenital deformities, and that goes all the way up to some people in their late 80s to early 90s who have reconstructive needs. Mm -hmm. For example, they may have senile electropion where they can't close their eyes, or they have issues with um, <clears throat> opening their eyelids where they can't see the other parts of their visual fields. So it, it, the, the spectrum is very broad. Are most of your patients female, male, or is it divided? Or, and do you see a lot more men coming for surgery? I would have to say the majority of our patients are, are female. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, although there are a lot of uh, uh, times when uh, we get male patients requiring uh, not just uh, aesthetic uh, procedures, reconstructive procedures. We get uh, certain spikes at different ages. For example, we'll get patients that are between 55 and 65 that come specifically for facelifts or facial rejuvenation. And then we get younger patients that uh, re uh, require or, or desire um, breast augmentation, breast lifts. Um, we get those patients between 20 and 40 years of age. And so it's, it's the entire spectrum, as, as Dominic said. So you have a patient between, say, 55 and 65, and they want to look younger, but they don't want surgery. What, can you do anything for them? Absolutely. Certainly. One of the main things that we recommend <clears throat> after, after what we've done is some research on what are the best non-surgical methods of facial rejuvenation. And we usually start off with something like a topical ointment, Retin-A, and a, a nice sun protective factor ointment to really protect from the sun. It makes a big difference. So sun damage is, sun is damage one of the is one reasons of the they're coming one to the, you. Exactly, yeah. one of the main this reasons. Is like pre prescription sunscreen? Prescription, correct. Wow. Well, pres no, not prescription sunscreen, but prescription, for example, like Retin-A. Mm -hmm. And what those will do is those will help to bring the skin to a nice even level in terms of bringing out all of those minor imperfections. At that point, what we do is we advance it to some type of photo rejuvenation therapy, such as an IPL. And in, which is an intense pulse light. That's a, uh, a method where you actually rejuvenate the collagen in the skin and you also take away a lot of the photo damage that's occurred in the, uh, in the dermal layers. For example, the pigmentation. If you're taking away the damage, can that be preventing skin cancer? In certain levels, yes. However, okay. it depends on if it's been advanced. And there's other ways to do that with IPL, but you mm -hmm. have to require an additional medicine with the IPL. Mm -hmm. Okay, so those are your, your first steps. So and yeah, well, I lots of things you can do before you start yes, uh, a with a broad with spectrum. A surgical mm -hmm. tools. And then from there, as Dominic mentioned, then the next step is to do a full analysis of the, of the, of the face. And then the next step would be fillers. Uh, is that the most common area? The face. We're talking yeah, the face. The yes. Nose, ears, the eyes, nose, and stuff mm -hmm. like yes. that. That's we, the most common. Yes. We divide the face in, in three and we analyze it by areas and see what it is that, the, that really is, is creating this aging effect on the patient. And we address each area. Botox is very popular. 
and it's, uh, it's very effective and it's FDA approved for at least the, the upper third, the forehead and the uh, crow's feet. The lower uh, portion of the face we can address with fillers. What would you do? Would you do Botox for, for the eyes and things so like yeah, that? Yeah, we selectively yeah. paralyze muscles and with that what we can do is not only reduce the amount of wrinkles but we can also uh, create a, a lift if we selectively uh, paralyze oh, really? muscles. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's a nice effect that we get with the, with the Botox. When we go to the lo lower portions of the, uh, of the face, we can use fillers, we can use um, also less invasive uh, methods. Just before going to, the, to an actual facelift, we can do th a thread lift, which is also something we like a lot. Uh, what, what is that? A thread lift, that. What a thread lift involves is using absorbable materials that you can essentially thread from different points, say, uh, to reduce the jowls or create a nicer neckline, and that is... Uh, short of a, of a formal surgery. It's a procedure still, but it's much less invasive. It can is be done under, term, under local. Is that a term? Do you use the medical term? Facelift? You call, you yeah, call we it use a facelift. Face mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah. It's, uh, and then we consider other combination therapies as, as a facelift and uh, laser, etc. Okay, so you have a, a whole arsenal of things you can do before Absolutely. the person has surgery and yes. they may or may not want surgery. Now with these um, non-surgical treatments, do they have to come every year, every two years, or does it just depend on, or do they last forever? Well, the, with the spectrum of IPL, what typically happens is they require about four to five treatments. The reason why we focus on that the most, it's the only treatment that's been shown in a five-year double-blind control study to be actually effective five years later. And that's... That's a long time. Yes, very <laughs> no. much so. And that's why that's the main one we use. And they actually took a face of several patients and did one side with the IPL and the other side was left untreated. And five years later, they were still able to tell which side was treated and which one was not. So it that, works that's, very well. That's amazing results because when, when usually these things have to be repeated, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. When often. someone comes to you, do, do they tell you what they want done and, and you might recommend something else? Uh, how does that usually work? A walk in through the door uh, re <laughs> requesting, do? <laughs> requesting <laughs> specific, <laughs> specific <laughs> therapies. They, they come in, you know, I heard thinking, about this, I heard about I heard this. About this is, you know, but it is our, our duty to really sit down and go over not just what uh, they need, but also what they don't need, <laughs> and uh -huh. uh, you know, and really do a full analysis uh, of the patient, and then that way they can make a, an informed decision as to what it is that they want. Right. Most of this stuff, I'm guessing, is is aesthetic, yes. Uh, yes. so would not be covered by insurance. Most of the time, no. No. Mm -hmm. no. The key also is their realistic expectations. Uh, a lot of times, people will come in when they have an event, a wedding or some, some large type of event like that, a big family party or a reunion. Uh, and they want to try to look their best. Unfortunately, some people want the most minimal things and have a maximal expectation. And we have to, and one of the key what, things, what for, for, uh, for example, well, for example, I had a lady who, who her daughter was getting married and she wanted to have some, some work done so she looked better in pictures. I want to look 10 years younger and 10 pounds thinner. What can you do? Exactly. Right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yes. exactly. And she wanted just uh, basically a filler. And I had to really explain to her that the results you're looking for are not going to, it's not, you're not going to be happy. I know what you're looking for and there's not enough time to do surgery before your wedding. And, uh, you, you know, you're not going to be happy. So they have fill it, right? a fill dermal it. filler to try to soften the wrinkles on her face. And she, what she wanted was a full facelift. What she had time for was a dermal filler. But her expectations were such that she wouldn't be happy. So what did you do? Uh, I didn't do anything. Nothing. No, because she wasn't going to have a, a good, she was not so going she to be happy. So she looked so good in the picture. <laughs> Maybe she did. You never yeah, so know. It's all about expectations yeah. and informing the patient uh, right. completely without giving them false, mm -hmm. you know, hopes about uh, the results. And I think that's the ethical thing to do, and I think that was great what you did. And um, and at the, uh, on the same token, it's uh, we do get some pretty impressive results with with the things that are available nowadays. I mean. Yeah, how has that, that changed so much? I know we talked about new procedures. What what would be so different? From <coughs> some, well, the one I think of mostly is the nose job. So someone come in 20 years ago, what would you have done 20 years ago as opposed to what you would do today? A lot of the procedures are quite old and they've been refined over the years and, and frankly are, are, are great. But I think what's changed over the last 15, 20 years, 
20 or last 10 years more, more, more than that is the fact that we're using combination therapies. Wouldn't you say maybe mm -hmm. lasers and, and fillers at the right. same time, uh, thread lifts, uh, without having to do a formal facelift, for example. Uh, these, these combination therapies give us a better opportunity to satisfy the, the patient without going all out. What do you think about that? Right. Well, well in, if he asked about the nose. So with nose, yeah. with nasal surgery, primarily uh, autographs of cartilage are have are being used more frequently now to Auto get graphs. autograph, meaning using your own cartilage, for example, from the septum in your nose or from your ear, to actually give you the the natural aesthetic result that you'd like. Well, that that's good because. Years ago, you could almost tell when someone had a nose lift. Right. I don't think you can tell so much nowadays. Right, exactly. Uh -huh. Easily, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You want to try to give it the best. You want to make sure that the person looks their best, but it looks natural. Now, you mentioned something about uh, plastic surgery, about your patient who didn't have enough time. What kind of time frame, if you wanted to have a facelift, when you'll, be, you'll see the results and, and they'll be what you want them to be? How, how long of a span is I that? I would say minimum three to four months. Okay, so if someone needs or wants to do something for an event, they need to plan it? At least three to four months, and ideally six to eight months. So that mm -hmm. party you know, on the Saturday night, you don't have time. I don't have time for that. I've got to make some other plans. <laughs> talk, talk a little bit about eyelid surgery, because that's another part of, uh, that's another procedure where a lot of women feel they look tired, they look older. You do something with their eyelids, they'll look better. And, and does that have an effect, a profound effect on the whole face, just doing that? Absolutely. It can be quite dramatic. Mm -hmm. One of the things that you have to dis make a distinction between is how much of that surgery is reconstructive in nature and how much is going to be aesthetic. Oh, that's uh, cool. And that's, that's why it's very important to make that differentiation in your initial consultation. For example, if someone comes in who has a significant amount of just eyelid hooding from extra skin, most likely that would be cosmetic. However, if there's uneven eyelids, then that becomes partially reconstructive because you actually have to, during your surgery, put the eyelids back into their correct position. And, and then all of a sudden, that's covered by insurance? That is covered by insurance with the proper documentation, yes. Because it's really reconstructive. You have a, an anatomical deficiency there. The muscle's actually separated from mm -hmm. where it should have been. And are all these changes basically from just gravity and everyday life and stress and worry and all that kind Smoking. of stuff? Smoking. Smoking too? Yes. Smoking is a big factor. I know it is with Birth wrinkles. And we can't say enough about smoking. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Smoking and sun, huh? Smoking those and are the sun. Avoid those two things if you can. And with eyes, people who have significant amount of allergies who rub their eyes a lot have a mechanical problem where they actually weaken their eyelids as well. And a lot of people don't realize that. The more you rub your eyes, the weaker they'll get. Wow. We've okay. been just asked to, to take, take a break. break. So don't go away. Yes. We're coming back. We have a lot more questions. Stay right where you are. Sure. Back in two minutes. Everything we are, underneath everything we do, we are all people, connected, interdependent, united. And when we reach out a hand to one, we can influence the condition of all. That's what it means to live united. the green crunchy ones myself. Whoa. Get out and explore nature. There's surprises everywhere. Go to discovertheforest.org. <clears throat> Anyone up for dessert? So here are the keys. Congratulations, it's officially yours. I'm sure you'll have many happy years here. Except for you, because you'll be gone three years from now, struck down by the same disease that got your father. So you won't be around for them. And sadly, it could have been detected early with a simple 